All right, kids, the next uh, concept is the concept of volume. Uh, you've probably heard about volume before, uh, but we haven't dealt with it yet with the study of 3D shapes. Uh, volume um, is to 3D shapes as area is to 2D shapes. In other words, we're interested with how much space the thing takes up, but in space now we're talking about, you know, like um, like air space or liquid space, or it's a, it's a whole new it's a whole new idea of uh, the size of something compared to area. Area before was you know like a flat surface basically, like you could unfold the net of one of these shapes and measure out how much um, flat space you'd have to paint if you were going to paint the whole thing. Now we're trying to fill the inside with with material basically to figure out how much of that would fit inside. Um, the one you're probably used to the most is volume to prism, so volume a box like this. It's the area of the base times the height. Now the area of the base already is a two-dimensional um, kind of measurement. It's length times width usually, or you know, base times height of the base down here. Those two dimensions now times this third one, we have for the first time ever a three-dimensional multiplication. Uh, we get these units in cubic um, cubic inches, cubic meters, um, that will represent volume. Um, so today we're going to do um, all four of the shapes we've already been dealing with. It's two different sections in the book, but it's really not that much harder to just add all of them at once. So cylinders and prisms were kind of the same thing, um, and, and cones and pyramids are kind of the same thing too. So we've got two, two things to deal with. Uh, for prisms first, what we're going to talk about, stuff like this, it's, again, it's the area of the base times the height. Now that could be a circle. That area of base could be a circle. We're talking about a can or a cylinder. Um, then it's gonna, still going to be the area of that base times the height. Okay. Uh, I love this thing. This is Cavalieri's principle. Uh, if two solids have the same height and same area of bases and same cross-sectional cross area at any height you could possibly take, then the two solids must have the same, um, must have the same area. Uh, so yeah, this box over here and this box over here, it looks like they just took this box and turned it sideways. Or they took this one and they leaned it over a bit. His principle basically says, um, if we took the base area, if we knew the base area of the two solids are the same, here they look like they're congruent um, squares actually, and the heights of the two things are congruent, great. And then here's the tricky, here's the tricky quasi-calculus part. If you slice this at any height and you look at how, um, how much area is at that height and how much area is that height. If, they're the, if you can tell they're the same all the way up and down, uh, then you're sure that the two volumes have the same side. Same, sorry, the two shapes have the same uh, volume. This was kind of revolutionary, just a second. Back in Cavalieri's day, yeah, this was kind of revolutionary because um, it allowed him to prove why the volumes of other solids, which people kind of knew, they thought they knew what they were, uh, why they are what they are. Here's one of my favorite ones. He compared this hemisphere to this shape, which is actually the space above this cone and inside the cylinder. So you can imagine a cone drilled out of a cylinder. Um, a lot of times I'll show this upside down from this way. Oh, can I flip this over? Ooh, maybe I can. Anyway, I, I won't know. So imagine um, you get this funky cup with a great big um, like cone dome in the bottom of it. So you can fill it from water at the top, but this thing goes all the way to the top versus a bowl. And at the bottom of those things, so we're going to raise and lower the water level, essentially. All the way at the bottom, of course, they're empty. And as you fill them up, it looks like this is the area you'd be, this would be the surface of the water as you go up to the top. And at the top, they're the same size circle, and they're the same height. Well, what's kind of cool about these two shapes, notice, I don't know if you can tell this, but they have the same height, and the radius of this uh, funny shaped cup is supposed to be the same as the radius of this. You can prove that at any height, these two blue surfaces have to have the same area. Notice at the bottom, they're all the way down to zero. And as you go up, they're both getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The blue areas are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And at the top, they're the same congruent circle. Since they are the same at every level, therefore, these two, these two solids have to have the same volume, which is kind of a funky concept. He was able to figure out that that worked. There's another one on here that's really cool. It has to do with, um, here it is, it has to do with uh, a sphere, but let's compare, let's compare a full sphere to this tetrahedron. I don't know if you can get what, it, what it's about. It's actually a pyramid, but it's, it's sitting on a very strange edge. Um, there we go. So we're going to fill these things with water, basically, or we're going to take cross sections at different heights. And he would prove that at the bottom, they both have area zero. You can prove at any height. It takes a bit of calculus and a bit of trig to figure this out. But at any height you can imagine, this flat circle and this flat rectangle have the same area. And since that's true for the whole range of this entire sweep, 
since that's, oh, I can't move this, yeah. If that's always the same, then the two solids have the same volume. He used that to find volume formulas for things that they didn't have volume formulas proven for at the same time, or uh, back in those days. So that was kind of cool. Uh, I've had you Wikipedia this guy. Oh, can I go this way? Sorry, I'm having, I'm having screen real estate problems. If I go like that, oh, there we go. So yeah, you'll find out that there's Colliery. He's uh, parading across the street, across the screen there. He's my favorite uh, 17th century Italian mathematician. I don't know who yours is, but um, oh, here's another one he did, which is kind of cool. There's a thing called a spherical ring. If you take a if you take a sphere and you hollow out, like you drill a cylinder, just like drilling a drill bit. If you drill straight through a cylinder, you'd be left with this thing that looks like a napkin ring. He, he was able to find the volume of that thing. Crazy stuff. What's cool about that is these two have the same volume, even though they have totally different sized spheres. Really, really cool stuff. Okay. Get that out. Well, no, I'm not going to worry about it. We're going to go to the next page. Okay. Let me let me resize this so you can see what's going on. That's going to take a second. And we're back. Okay. So um, we're going to use that principle. We're going to use... Basically, we're going to use that idea to, to justify to you why these volume formulas are the way they are. Um... We took care of, of, oh, wait a second, I think I messed up. No, I didn't, just freaking myself out. Uh, we've already just, you know, given you the reason why area of the base times the height is the volume for a prism, and that also works for cylinders. But for pyramids, it's a little weirder. Um, one way to show, okay, how are we going to get the, how are we going to get volumes of pyramids? You've looked at a lot of pyramids, and you're probably thinking, how on earth are we going to get this volume? It's not just area of the base times height. That would be way too big. Area of the base of this triangle times its height would be the volume of this um, the volume of this uh, prism. And what Cavalieri was able to do, and others, is you slice this prism. You have to start with the triangular one for this particular one to work, but this is a really cool one. It's easy to show. Uh, you take this prism and you slice it into three pyramids as such. I don't know if you can tell how these are working, but they're sliced in a certain way. You can look at this too. This is the same, this is the same uh, idea over here. The, the red, sorry, the orange, yellow, and green fit into this um, blue box, if you can imagine that way. Uh, I don't know if it's, if it's shown very well in here, but what happens when you do that, you get three pyramids that have equal volume. Um, I think it's hard to see on here where they're labeling these heights and these these uh, bases and stuff. I think I found another uh, website that does it better, a little bit better. This is the same idea. They took this uh, pyramid and they sliced it along triangle DBC. And then, the, then they, so they peeled off this pyramid A, B, C, D, that's come off, and this is what's left. So it's kind of like stage one was the full pyramid, a full prism. Then they, they pulled this thing off here in stage two. Uh, and then they pulled this one off here in stage three. They sliced what was remaining along uh, plane C, D, E, and they pull off this funky one. So in the end, you have pyramid one, Pyramid two. If I think if they labeled it like the last, like the last uh, picture, this pyramid and this pyramid are congruent. Actually, they're kind of they're kind of easy to see. Like they they kept this top face intact and they sliced it down to this corner. Then they left the bottom face intact and they sliced it up to C. And what's left is this really funky, flat-ish kind of pyramid that's that's uh, smashed in between those. You can pretty quickly see, if you if you had these in your hands and you set them on the table, well, first of all, Pyramid 1 and Pyramid 2 are congruent. They're exactly the same pyramid. Pyramid 3, if you set it down on the floor on, on triangle CDE, notice you could also set this pyramid on the floor on its CDE. Those are the same C's, D's, and E's. That's just where we cut it. You set those down, you could see that P, uh, sorry, point B would be the same height off the table as point F would be off the table. So we're looking at these two pyramids and it's like, well, they have the same base, they have the same height, they must have the same volume. So all three of these pyramids have, that came out of here had the same volume. Uh, therefore, the volume of a pyramid is one third of the volume of the prism that it lives in. Dun, dun, dun. Here's the punchline. Remembering why that's true, probably not such a big idea. Remembering that it's one third, also not a huge deal because it's going to be on the formula sheet. But um, that's why it's one third if you're curious. Uh, a lot of times what teachers will do is they, they have these um, models of these things in their classroom and a sink. I don't have a sink in my classroom, but uh, I have this and I had um, 
you know, a, like a, a, a cube box that was the same size as this, size as this, it would take three of these to fill up the box. It's perfect. Or if I had a cylinder that was as tall as this, as tall and as fat as this cone, it would take three of these cones to fill up the cylinder. So the cone is exactly one third. That's where we get this one third in here. It's one third of the enclosing prism. All right. So here's just a nice little organizational chart of all that stuff. Prisms are just volume equals the area of the base times the height. Now we use capital B for these because this is the result of a previous formula that's not just base like we were thinking of before as one length. This is actually base area. So there's a whole pentagon that goes into this. This is kind of a pain to remember all this now. This is why these test questions are so long. But uh, half AP was what goes on to all this whole thing just to find this base. Then take that times the height of the prism and you'll get the volume of the entire prism. Same thing here, the base of this thing is actually an entire circle, which is pi r squared h, that's, or sorry, yeah, pi r squared, that's actually just the b. That's not a fraction bar, that's a brace. Uh, and then if, if it's a pointy thing, in other words, if it's a pyramid or cone and not a prism or cylinder, you just do the same exact formula, error of the base times the height, but then don't forget to multiply by one third. All right, am I gonna have time to do all these before the time runs out? I don't know. All right, so some of the hard parts on these, this is um, fine volume now. Maybe the hardest thing on this for some people is just figuring out which formula to use for this shape. What is this thing? And uh, you know, before I even start, what is it will tell me which formula to go to? Well, um, remembering your definitions of what a prism is, what a, what a, uh, a pyramid is, because uh, some people are going to incorrectly name this as a pyramid, and it's not. It's a prism. The definition of prism is that it's got to have two congruent parallel faces um, which we will call the bases, and that's important that those are the bases, and they're connected all by rectangles. If you rewind and listen to that definition three or four more times, you will come to the conclusion, and the only correct conclusion here is that this front triangle is a base, and this back triangle is a base, and they're connected by rectangles. So this is a triangular prism. There's no other way to define this. Okay, so that tells us we are in prism land. We need to use the prism volume formula. We need to find the area of the base, and oh yes, we are all about that, and this is the base. It's a triangle. So, all right, finding area, sorry, volume equals area of the base times the height, and more specifically, that base, again, which we are all about, that one, is a triangle. That is a triangle times the height. Okay, it gets more confusing. I have an H here, and I have an H here, and you're probably going, oh, hey, that's H squared. Wait a second. They stand for different heights. Oh my gosh. You weren't confused yet? I'm sure you are now. Uh, so you really kind of want to do these things separately. This, this makes it look really complicated. Uh, find, the, find the area of the triangle first, and then let's worry about taking times the height of the pyramid. This is height of triangle. This is height of pyramid. Different H. Okay, that's height of pyramid. What is half times base times height in the triangle? Oh gosh, well, this, in this part of the problem, you are really living in two dimensions. We're just looking at this triangle and we're trying to find its area. And that triangle, sometimes it helps to draw it separately, is a five right triangle with a hypotenuse of 13. Yes, that's the same over here as it is over here. So I need to know base times height in this triangle and I don't have this. I'd have to do Pythagorean theorem. This is five times, five, sorry, five squared plus x squared equals 13 squared. Pythagorean theorem, you've done this one a lot. This one turns out to be 12. So once I know that's 12, I can say, okay, this triangle is half times 12 times five. Then, so that's area of base, times uh, the height of the prism. The height of the prism here, kids, is nine. Uh, ooh, did you hear the thunder? Did you hear the thunder when I said that? That was awesome. The height is nine, thunder, okay. Um, Area of the base, remember we're, we're talking about bases are the congruent parallel things. Height is the edge of one of those rectangles that connects them from one base to the other. Just because this thing isn't sitting on a base doesn't mean you know, the height is going up and down and that kind of stuff. So the height is not necessarily how high up into the sky it reaches. It's the distance between these parallel faces. So that is the nine is the height. Okay, so half times 12 times five, that's 30 and 30. So area of the triangle, if you want to see it by itself. Area of the triangle is 30, nine is the height of the prism. So we are talking about a volume of 270. I'm going to stop right there and we'll do the other couple problems in the other part. Thanks for watching.